in your sight May this place be filled With the fragrance of Trendsetters, how about that? We get that. So we're going. To, this is uh, we're going to continue on. We've been in Philippians chapter four, verses six through seven, and and so forth. And that's we're going to go back there again today. And uh, and and you know, it really. I think about this actually last night. Um, you know, Pastor Michael was teaching from um, Isaiah. Uh, he was in what Isaiah 49 last night, and and he actually he started out um, his message with uh, verse 22 out of Isaiah 48. He said, "There is no peace," says the Lord, "for the wicked." Right, and actually, if you back up into chapter 48 of Isaiah, it also says, uh, um, "Oh, this is verse 18. Oh, that you had heeded my commandments." then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. And it goes on about descendants and so forth. But a lot of discussion about peace, and that's really what our focus is going to be on today is peace. You know, uh, Paul told us here in, in Philippians chapter 4, uh, verses 6 and 7, he says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Um, you know, how many times have you sat back and thought, wouldn't it be nice to have a little peace in my life? 
and um, we get such we get in such a hurry about stuff, all kinds of things, and um, it, you know, the cool part about it is, as Christians, though, right, that we do have a source of peace that is beyond. Um, any other. We've got promises to stand on. Uh, we've got promises to put our hope in. And uh, the, the hope and assurance that we have um, is just overwhelming. It, it really is. Um, but, you know, there's so many of us still struggle day to day with experiencing peace. And, and it really shouldn't be that way. Um, and I'm not saying this really in the sense of you need to be doing something different, but more, it's more about this is not what God intended for us. Uh, God intended for his children to experience peace. Um, you know, we just read you know, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, and, and it's kind of hard to separate those two verses because uh, they're like different sides of the same coin. Um, on one side, there's the role of prayer, right? And, and uh, we covered that. And on the other side of that coin is this peace that passes all understanding. Now, if we look through the Bible, we can find a lot of other references regarding peace. Uh, there's actually only two verses that, that use the exact phrase, peace of God, uh, that was in Philippians 4 and also in Colossians 3.15. Uh, Paul says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. So both of these verses, right, they're pretty similar in form and intent. And, um, and I think you can also equate when it talks about peace of God, there's a number of verses that talk about uh, the, the, the peace of Jesus, right? Uh, in, in John 14, 27, Jesus gives his peace to his disciples. In Paul 5, when Paul tells us we have peace with God through the work of his son. Romans 8, right? Uh, Paul compares a spiritual mind versus a carnal mind. And he says this, to, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Romans 14, 17, we see God's kingdom consists of peace and righteousness and joy. And then over in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul uses a piece to talk about how God has brought Jews and Gentiles together into one body, the body of Jesus Christ. Now, these are all Paul's writings that I've just referenced other than in John. Uh, we also get a lot of that in the Old Testament. We just covered a little bit out of uh, Isaiah 48, 49. Uh, the entire chapter of Isaiah 55, right, uh, is... Just about the entire chapter talks about the peace of God. Uh, one of the verses says, Indeed, you will go out with joy, and you will be led along in peace. Isaiah 26, 3, You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all those whose thoughts are fixed on you. Yeah, you know, there's... Give me another two hours, and we can go into quite a few more that talk about that, but uh, we won't do that today. So what is peace, right? We've got to kind of put a definition around. What are we talking about here? Well, in, in the scripture, it gets used, from what I see, in, in two different ways. Uh, one, uh, one is a lack of conflict, right? There's no back and forth going on, whether that's personally, relationally, politically, right? There's, there's that, that kind of peace, this lack of conflict. The, the other use it sees is, is really it's a sense of well-being, a sense of contentment. Uh, Matthew Henry, I don't know if you've read any of his commentary uh, that, that he's done on the Bible. He says this uh, in describing peace from Philippians. He says, the peace of God, the comfortable sense of being reconciled to God and having a part in his favor and the hope of the heavenly blessedness are a greater good than can be fully expressed. This peace will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It will keep us from sinning under troubles and from sinking under them, keep us calm and with inward satisfaction. So this sense of well-being and sense of reconciliation is a peace that you know, Philippians 4 is, is really talking about. Um, and as we already talked, there's a number of verses that, that refer to God as the God of peace. Romans 15, 33, Romans 16, 20, and so forth. 
And we read through all of these and it tells us that he is a God of order and his dominion is peaceful as a result. He's not unstable, he's not whimsical, he's not disordered or chaotic. And because of who he is, you know, we can experience peace. That's a kind of interesting thing. You see things that are, that are going on, even in Christian circles, right? When there's a lot of chaos going on, God's not in the middle of it. That's a sign. It, you know, this is a sign of man getting in the middle of things and, and trying to mix it up and so forth. That chaos is just not God's path. If we look at the other side of peace, what peace is not, well, it's not fear and it's not anxiety about what's coming down the road at us. It's not peace with God. That peace with God only comes through a relationship with him and through Jesus Christ, right? And the other thing, it's not about inactivity it's, or the lack of doing things. Um, sometimes we think about what's peace. Well, it's, you know, it's kind of hanging out at the beach someplace, not having a care in the world and so forth. Um, that's not really scriptural on how the Bible describes peace, right? Um, we know that, uh, um, well, in Luke, right, uh, he tells us in, in Acts, the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was built up. Well, there was a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, there was a lot of things at work to do that. Um, it, it, the psalmist tells us, although God is a God of peace, he is also one who will neither slumber nor sleep. He's a God who's continually working. We read that. John tells us that in chapter 5. And even though heaven is a place of peace, it's also a place of continual praise to God and service to him. Um, and so, you know, I think we can think about God's peace as meaning that in, in God's being and in his actions, he is apart from all confusion and disorder, yet he's continually active in innumerable, well-ordered, fully controlled, simultaneous actions. We see things from our view, but we're not getting it from his view on how all of these things connect together. Um, the psalmist, uh, Psalm 46, right? Uh, they use uh, some chaos sometimes as, as, as imagery, right? Psalm 46, God is our strong refuge. He is truly our helper in times of trouble. For this reason, we do not fear when the earth shakes and the mountains tumble into the depths of the sea, when its waves crash and foam and the mountains shake before the surging sea. God is a contrast to the chaos. He's the foundation. He's the rock. And the very thing that makes peace in this chaotic world actually possible. Max Lucado said this about it. Our Father gives us the very peace of God. He downloads the tranquility of the throne room into our world, resulting in an inexplicable calm. We should be worried, but we aren't. We should be upset, but we are comforted. The peace of God transcends all logic, scheming, and efforts to explain it. Max Lucado. So we're doing so good in Philippians. Let's go into Chronicles. Turn with me, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. That's page 526 in my Bible. <laughs> Excuse me. Second Chronicles chapter 20. I'm going to start reading in verse 1. It happened after this that the people of Moab uh, with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is En Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord, and from all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? 
and do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might, so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God, who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel, and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? And they dwell in it, and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, If disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now, here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. And here they are, rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. So things are getting kind of dicey, right, with, with, with uh, uh, Jehoshaphat and, and his fellow citizens. Uh, the armies are gathering, so they're told, on the, uh, on the outskirts. And uh, they're believing that they're subject to, to kind of a perfect storm, right? That things are coming together. So what did Jehoshaphat do about this? So let's look at verse 3. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Jehoshaphat, his first action was to go pray. Lord, I don't know what to do about this stuff. You're the one to put us here. We're under your control. You know, we need you to resolve whatever is going on here, right? And, you know, isn't it when we get in the middle of stuff going on that, you know, one of our first questions is, where is God in all of this? You know, the, the disciples probably asked that same question. Remember when they were out on the boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and the storm is blowing up, and where are you? You know, but when we face the storms of life, right, Paul encourages us, right, from Philippians, right, pray, right, take it to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, we see the flip side of it. We're not going to read all of it, but 2 Kings chapter 18, when you go home, you might take a read through 18 and 19 there about Hezekiah. Now, Hezekiah, he was a pretty good guy. He was a good king. Hezekiah loved the Lord. Uh, and from what we read about him, he had a, a pretty deep walk with, with God. Uh, but nevertheless, he found himself in similar difficulties as Jehoshaphat. In his time, it was Sina Sennacherib. And, uh, I pronounce it the way I pronounce it. So. <laughs> right? Second one to the party is... Uh, <laughs> So Sennacherib and his million-man Assyrian army were marching towards Jerusalem, right? And, uh, and now these guys, these Assyrians, they were pretty bad. Uh, they're the ones they invented the, uh, the battering ram. Uh, they, had, they learned how to conduct a siege like no other. And, uh, and their history had been they were actually unbeatable in battle and unparalleled in the brutality that they inflicted upon their victims. Well, what does Hezekiah do about it? Well, first thing he tried to do was to solve the problem financially. He, uh, uh, he wanted to pull all the gold out of the temple and offer that up as a bribe to uh, Sennacherib. And uh, his plan backfired. Uh, because actually that just kind of lit the fires under Senecrib to want to come in and take even more. Well, you got this much in the temple, what else have we got, right, in plunder? Then Hezekiah's next plan was to go build an alliance with Egypt. 
he went down, he, you know, his thought was, hey, you know, come with us. You guys have got an army. You can join with us and we'll fight this thing off because after, after they get us, they're coming to get you, right, was kind of his thing. So he had that, that uh, you know, was kind of had that thought, but then um, it, it's kind of interesting how God intervenes, right? He said, Isaiah the prophet um, said this in Isaiah chapter 30. He says, Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, uh, who take counsel, but not of me, and who devise plans, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. Who walk to go down to Egypt and have not asked my advice to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. So in other words, uh, what God wants from you in this time of crisis, right, is for you to return to him and to wait on him um, and to be quiet. And uh, it's just not in our DNA, is it? <laughs> you know, and, uh, you, know, I, you know, how many times, you know, when we've been feeling pressures, whether it's relationally or on the job or in ministry or finances, and, and we're saying, help me to this counselor or save me to some other group, when all along the Lord wants us to say, you know, come to me. Come to him who can really truly give you the peace. We say, well, I don't have time to pray. I'm late for my counseling appointment. I don't have time to seek the Lord. I've got to strip the temple of gold to pay off Sennacherib. Uh, yet all of this, Paul tells us, don't be anxious, not to be full of care about anything. And and he's not saying this is a, you know, be happy, don't worry. Uh, because he goes beyond being happy. He tells us go to prayer, right? By everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, last time we were together, which seems like a long, long time ago, we, right, we, we focused on prayer, right? Prayer. And, and when we talk about prayer, that means our general communion with God. Uh, and supplication means bringing him specific requests. Um, you know, I, sometimes you hear the prayers about, oh, you know, let's solve world hunger, God. And that's fluff, right? God wants us to get to the point, get to the details. Who's who, what's what, and so forth. What are the issues that, that you need to get resolved, right? And, uh, you know, and Paul tells us, be anxious about nothing, pray about everything, and give thanks for anything. Now we say, well, that's pretty easy for Paul to say, right? Things always went his way. Well, not really. Uh, here's what he said in Romans 15. He says, now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Well, you know, he's coming to the end of his letter to the Romans. Pray with me first, I might be delivered from my enemies, my service might be accepted, uh, and so forth. It didn't happen that way with Paul. His ministry was not accepted, right? Um, and, and the only way he got back to Rome was not as a minister. He went back as a prisoner. Um, you know, I think what, when we really get down to it, the real deal about prayer is this. God can say yes to our prayers, or he can say no. Either way, it's an answer. Um, and if you think about how many times have you taken something to God and said, here's my request, here's what I'd like to see, and you get on down the road a bit, well, that's not what was needed at all. And he didn't take that path with me. He chose another. <laughs> Sometimes, I, 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 Jesus said, said this in, in, in Luke. He says, if your child asks for bread, which of you would give him a stone? Or if he wants a fish, 
who of you would give him a scorpion? So sometimes we think we're asking for halibut, uh, but the Lord really recognizes it as a scorpion. And uh, sometimes we cry out for bread, but the Lord sees it as a boulder. And he loves us too much to give us something that would hurt us. So uh, what are we to do? Well, Paul tells us we're to make our request and then rest in God's peace, a peace that passes our understanding. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We say, Lord, I choose not to wring my hands about this and try to figure out how I can strip the temple or get aligned with Egypt. I choose to return to you and to rest in you and to be thankful for anything that you decide to do. Seek the Lord, Isaiah said, and Hezekiah did just that. Even as Sennacherib, oh, man, that guy's got a tough name, right? <laughs> it, things were pretty ominous, right? Um, and, and Sennacherib actually diverted his troops uh, to a different uprising uh, northeast of Jerusalem. Now, his general, Rabshakeh, another great name, <laughs> he sent a letter to Hezekiah that said, if you think we're through with you, you're sadly mistaken. We will not be stopped from destroying Jerusalem. We ever get a letter like that? Intimidating, threatening, disheartening, service will be suspended in five days, blah, blah, blah. This time, however, Hezekiah didn't say, oh no, what am I going to do? Well, who can I call and so forth? No, having heard the word from Isaiah, Hezekiah took Rabbishek's letter into the temple and opened it up before the Lord and said, Lord, I'm giving this to you. And uh, uh, you read all about that Second Kings chapter 19 on how that turns out. You know, here on earth, things seem so big, our, our mountains are what, nearly 30,000 feet tall, and the depths of the Marianas Trench is like 36, 37,000 feet deep. But from space, have you seen the pictures? It looks like a smooth ball, right? The further we get away from it, right? Uh, it, I, I found this little thing. In fact, if our Earth was shrunk to the size of a bowling ball, a brand new unused bowling ball would have more grooves and valleys in it than would our Earth. Right? It's just a matter of perspective. You know, like Hezekiah, when we get above the situation, suddenly, right, the problems that were so great, and uh, uh, they, they take on different proportions. Um, and, you know, the story with Hezekiah goes on, right? He, Isaiah comes back to him, the Lord has spoken that not one person in Jerusalem will be harmed and not one arrow shall enter the city. Well, the Assyrians showed up uh, and as was their custom, they surrounded the city and all it would have taken to nullify, right? Isaiah's prophecy would be for one arrow to get fired over the wall, but it didn't happen. Uh, the Assyrians set up their camp. There's something like 185,000 soldiers. Uh, but that night, an angel of the Lord came and struck the Assyrians before even one man uh, could string his bow. 185,000 were wiped out in a way that Hezekiah never, ever could have orchestrated or predicted. Um, and that's the way of the Lord, right? Uh, so what does he say to you and me today? He says, take your cares and turn them into prayer. Um, we all know this. We've heard the lessons over and over again, but do we do it? Do we leave our anxieties and concerns with the Lord? Or even as we read the words from the scripture, are we thinking of other ways to get our problems resolved? In Acts chapter 27, Paul tells his fellow shipmates, Last night an angel of the God to whom I belong and serve stood beside me. So there, there, there's pr three promises that, that we can really gain from these words, right? The first promise is that God will send his angels to help you during life's storms. 
Um, Psalm 91, 11, and 12. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Now, this is a verse that, that Satan quoted to Jesus, right, when, when Jesus was in the wilderness. Uh, Satan, uh, you know, it caused Jesus really to be taken up to the pinnacle of the temple. Jump, he said, after all, you won't get hurt because the angels will keep you, uh, you know, from, uh, from, from dashing your, your foot against a stone. Uh, but Satan kind of left out a part, right, that he says uh, he left out in all thy ways. Uh, in other words, the promise was made that would Jesus be kept in all his ways, not in all of Satan's suggestions. Uh, Jesus said, this isn't a chance for me to test my father. It's an opportunity for me to trust my father. He shall keep me in all my ways, and my way is to lay down my life, to let go of my will. Uh, there's a couple others, that, that Matthew 18.10, Hebrews 1.14, got that same theme. There's a second promise is that we belong to God. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 103, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We exist for God. God doesn't exist for us. Uh, he's a loving father who loves us, but he's also our creator, right, who made us. Why are we to worship him? Well, there's benefits and blessings for us ultimately but really comes down to the fact that he is God. And the final promise is this, that God has a heavenly mission for your life. Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Um, you know, we, we might think we're not very impressive, but look in the mirror and can consider what God had to work with. I got a halo today. You know, all you got to do is just turn on the television or the internet and you'll hear something talked about Christians, right? Christians aren't great. There's all kinds of inconsistency and hypocrisy and problems and blah, 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 blah. And, and truly, I've gotten so anymore when I hear that, I think, huh? well, yeah, it's probably true. But you should see me before God came into my life, right? And, uh, and that's what it's about. We are works in progress and, and so forth. So in, in, in closing today, right, God promises to guard our hearts and our minds uh, through Jesus. Now, when we bring our request before him and we entrust our cares in, to him, he really serves as that strong wall of protection that we need around our thoughts and our emotions. He gives us a peace we can't comprehend, uh, no matter how big the storm. Here's something for you to think about doing. In your quiet time with the Lord, write down whatever concerns you have today. What could be relations, ministry, finances, family issue, whatever. Write it down. And then do as Hezekiah. Lay it before the Lord. God, this is what's bothering me. This is the trouble I have. This is what I need to get resolved. And Father, I look to you to free me of this burden and then leave it there. Leave it to him. And I think you'll experience a peace that, that comes about, that he's got it, he'll take care. Amen? Amen. Well, let's pray and we'll end our time together. Father, we come before you today and uh, thank you for the wisdom of your word. Lord, you, you tell us to, 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 to bring us, bring you those things that are on our hearts, that are on our minds, that trouble us, and to lay them before you and just take rest that, that you've got it under hand and, and you'll get it taken care of. And Father, Help us to learn to engage with that process and, and give these things over to you. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Father, we ask you to bless those that weren't able to be with us here today and uh, encourage, Lord, encourage all. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.